the word? Amen. If you are, say, bring it on. Amen. I just want to challenge you to end the year with hope. End the year with hope. As Sister Carrie said, persevere with hope in your heart. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 is uh, my key verse for today. And this is what the Word says. It says, let us, that's talking about you and me, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. You know what that's telling us? Hold on to hope. How many of you know that hope can slip away? Hope can disappear. And uh, we don't want that to happen, so we've got to hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Can we give a big hand clap for the faithful God today? Amen? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray you'd take this message. I pray that you would allow hope to spring forth in our hearts. God, by the power of the Spirit of God, let hope rise up in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin today with the true story of a man who held on to hope. In the summer of 2017, two longtime commercial fishermen, John Aldridge and Anthony Sosinski, set out to fish from Long Island. As they headed out to sea about 40 miles offshore, Anthony, it was early in the morning, Anthony was sleeping below deck while John was uh, starting to get things ready to go fishing in about three or four hours when they got to the place where they were going to fish. And he was pulling on a handle with all of his might when it snapped, sending him sprawling backwards and right off the back of the boat. The boat was on autopilot. And so it just kept going. And as soon as he resurfaced, you know, from the water, he began to cry out to his friend and co-worker. But Anthony did not hear him because Anthony was below deck asleep. And uh, he, John just watched that boat speed away. He was all alone treading water in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without a life vest, thinking that perhaps this was the way he was going to die. And while John was trying to calm down and quiet his thoughts of certain death and stay afloat, he realized that his boots were very buoyant, and he got an idea. He took one of his boots off, emptied out the water, and plunged it back into the water so that it created an air pocket and it did, and it floated. And so he stuck both of his boots under his arms as a flotation device, and he realized that at least I can stay afloat for a long time. And that was a flicker of hope. Come on. How many of you know sometimes that's all it seems like we have? Just a little flicker of hope. Just a little tiny bit of hope. But we've got to do what? According to the word today, we hold on to the hope that we profess. Three hours later, guess who woke up? Anthony woke up. He went to up above deck and realized that John was gone, called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard said, look, there's very little hope that we're going to find this person in all this water. They had no idea when he had fallen off. Uh, but, but John kept, I believe, crying out to God because I watched the video of him and he said, begin to give God praise. Come on. He began to thank God that he had made it from that. And uh, the hours kept passing. He finally made it to the morning, and he finally uh, spotted a fishing uh, buoy and was able to reach it and climb up on it. And it wasn't very long after that. The Coast Guard saw him, and they rescued him. And they said to him, we've been looking for you for nine hours. And his response was, well, I've been looking for you for 12. Amen. But he, what a great story of holding on to hope. And if it were most of us out there bobbling around in the middle of the ocean, I tell you, I would have a hard time hanging on to hope in a situation like that. But you know what? Hope is like that. Hope is that little whisper in our spirit that says, hey, maybe if you turn these boots upside down, they'll hold water and you can float. And for us, as we come through the final month, of 2020. How many of you are going to be glad to say goodbye to 2020? Come on. When we come to the final month of 2020, we need to hear the whisper 
of the, what the Spirit of God is saying in our ear. And I want to challenge you to it today to not assume that the future is going to be dark and worse. I believe that 2021 20, can be better. And if you believe that, would you just give God some praise today? Come on. Amen. And there's only one sure reason that I know that 2021 can be better. And that is this, because God is with us. Amen. How many of you know if God is with you, you know, we've got something to hold on to. Amen. We've got a hope to hold on to. And it's not that we can turn our boots upside down. We've got something a whole lot more sure than that. Come on, somebody. We've got the power of the Word of Almighty God. We've got the family of God that we can walk with. And most of all, we have God Himself who promised us that He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He said that and He, he meant it. Amen. I'm excited about the theme of God with us. Amen. And for the next few weeks, we're focusing on the fact that God is with us. And when God is with us, we have hope, we have joy, we have peace, and we have light and life. And what a wonderful Christmas theme. Oh, if you have your Bible, you can look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 23. Matthew's quoting from Isaiah, and this is what he says. He says, Behold... The virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Tell your neighbor, hold on to hope, God's with you. Hold on to hope, my friend, God is with you. And I want to look at hope through three lenses today. Hope in the past, hope in the present, and hope in the future, all right? All right, hope in the past. Now, I want you to imagine with me what it must have been like in the Garden of Eden. Amen? With Adam and Eve. There were no stressful moments in the Garden. There were no difficulties. There was no danger of dying of a disease or COVID or death. But the thing that made the Garden wonderful, besides the perfect climate and the perfect health and plenty of food to eat and, you know, plenty of time to rest, was the, what made it wonderful was the fact that God was with them. Amen? Adam and Eve, in their innocence, they knew God. God would come down and walk with them in the cool of the day. They could talk to Him. They knew His voice. They knew His presence. But as you and I know, they came. To, that all came to an end when Eve was deceived by the serpent. And then Adam then deliberately partook of the tree that God had said not to eat of. And I'm sure after that happened, they were wondering what's going to happen to us. I'm sure the angels were watching on from heaven and thinking, what is God going to do? How will he deal with the people who had chosen to turn away from him and disobey him? Would he destroy them and start over? And of course, we know that the answer to that is no, right? How many of you know that salvation begins with the simple understanding that God didn't give up on the human race? God was determined to do something. He would not allow Satan to win the battle for planet Earth. And it, the rest of the Old Testament actually is the progressive unfolding of God's plan to counteract what happened in the Garden of Eden. At that point in time, God made a promise. And while that promise seems vague, it was just a glimmer of hope after the fall. That promise in its purest form was this. God would do something about sin by sending someone to earth. But who? And when? And where? And how? Nobody really knew and understand. But God revealed that this someone was going to be a member of the human race. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is really the first flicker of hope that we've got to hold on to in our world. This is what God said. He said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. How many of you know that God loves the human race so much that He did not let Adam and Eve walk out of the Garden of Eden without having at least a glimmer of hope to hold on to? 
Amen. They held on to that hope. And this verse contains an amazing amount of information concerning God's plan to rescue the human race. Let me go over it with you real quick. Number one, God's plan centered in a specific person. Number two, that person would be a man. Number three, he will enter the human race by being born of a woman. Number four, he will do battle with Satan. Number five, Satan will strike a blow against him but will not defeat him. And number six, this is the part I like the best, he will crush Satan at his power. Come on, somebody. The deliverer, when he comes, is going to be the seed of the woman. That means that he's not going to be an angel or some supernatural creature, but he will be fully man, and he will enter the human race by being born of a woman. Let me tell you, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that first little flicker of hope is the long, it begins the, is the first link in the long chain that leads us all the way to Bethlehem. And so a promise has been given. And in God's remarks to the serpent, God looked forward to that time when one would be born that they would call Jesus. Come on, can we give a hand for Jesus today? Amen. Across decades, they looked, they watched. Across centuries, actually, across millennia, they were waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. From the times of Abraham and Isaac to, you know, Jacob and David, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the other prophets held on to that hope. And God kept revealing details of what this hope would look like. Throughout the Old Testament, there was a repeating history of both devotion to God and and neglect of God. There was prosperity and there was recession. There was feast and actually literal famine. There was pleasure and pain. And you see the Hebrew people, they weren't really much different than us. Come on. When things got good, they tended to forget about God. And when things got bad, they cried out for God's help again. But I want you to understand that through it all, through it all, there was this deep, An ongoing longing for God to fulfill His covenant and the promise of a Messiah who would come to make everything right. And this wasn't just a happy, you know, kind of a little idea that drifted in and out of the Israelites' consciousness and culture. No, my friend, this was a deep hope. This was the deepest hope that sustained them and encouraged them and spurred them on, especially through thousands of years of waiting And as time goes on, God revealed more and more. One verse at a time, we learn from the prophets that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be a descendant of David, that he would be born of a virgin, that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. And people were anticipating his arrival on the earth. They were looking forward of it. And how interesting that the prophets just kept pushing and talking about this one that was to come that was called the Messiah. And then after the book of Malachi, there's what I call the dramatic pause. God seemingly went silent, or at least men stopped hearing. For 400 years, there was quietness between Malachi and Matthew. And then when you get to the book of Luke, things begin to happen. Later, Paul would write of it like this, Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. He said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, most of us know all the details of Christ coming to the earth. Amen. A priest by the name of Zechariah was told that he, his wife was barren and that he was told he would have a child, right? That son was born and he became John the Baptist who helped to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And then a young virgin, young girl by the name of Murray has an angelic visitor and is told that you're going to be the one to carry the Messiah. And she became pregnant having never known a man. And then her, her betrothed, her, her fiance,
fiance, we could say. Joseph found out about it. He was about ready to put her away until he also had a, an angelic vision. And then one night it finally happened. And what a glorious night that must have been. As, as shepherds in the field looked up and all of the heavens burst forth in the praise and burst forth in the song. And the scripture tells us this in Luke 2, 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. I want you to understand that the night that Jesus Christ was born was the night that hope came. Come on, somebody. Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise of God. And Jesus Christ is and was and shall forever be the hope of Israel. And Jesus Christ is and was and shall forever be my hope and your hope today. Come on. And I'm just amazed at those Old Testament prophets. How that they held on to that hope for millennia. 4,000 years later, the promise of Genesis 3 and verse 15 was finally fulfilled. They held on to hope. Looking back, we understand it. It's easy for us to see how that was hope. Amen? Because we know the whole story. Come on. Is there anybody that's glad that Jesus went to the cross for them? Is there anybody that's glad that he didn't stay buried in a grave, but on the third day came out, amen, resurrected and alive? Is there anybody that's excited for the fact that Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father? Come on, somebody. We know who he is, that he has hope. And it's because of him that we can have hope and we can have knowledge that anyone's sins can be forgiven. Given, that healing can come our way. And most of all, that Satan's dominion and power over the earth has been given a powerful blow. Woo! All of those who lived before held on to that hope. And I love when we get to Luke, the, the parts of that story that talk about an old man by the name of Simeon. Oh, I want to meet Simeon when I get to heaven. Amen? And he was a just and a devout man. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the hope of Israel. And he had waited all those years. And he was in the temple on a daily basis because God had revealed to him that he was not going to die until he saw the Messiah with his own eyes. And that day when Mary and Joseph came up on the south side of the temple and entered up in there, I think that it must have been, it must have been a Simeon that saw him and he realized who he was and he ran over and he grabbed baby Jesus just eight days old. And he said, I can die in peace now because my eyes Eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. Come on, somebody. That's our hope today. There was a little old widow lady by the name of Anna. I don't know how many, I think it said 84 years or 65. So many years that she had been a widow and she just never left the temple. Watching and waiting, looking and she saw him as, as well. So here's my question for you today. If they can wait 4,000 years for the promise to be fulfilled. If Simeon and Anna can wait all those years, why are we so impatient? Come on, somebody. Come on. Why can we not have a little hope in our God? Why can you say, well, I'm hoping for revival. I'm hoping for a move of God. I'd like to see this place filled. I'd like to see God. Let me tell you something. Hope on, my friend, because Jesus is our hope. Amen. He's our hope. Amen. But he's more than just hope in the past. I got news for you. Jesus is hope in the present. Amen. I wonder is there anybody that's glad that, they, that there is hope in the present. Someone told a pastor one time. They said, sir, I love you preaching about the sweet by and by. But I tell you what, I need help in the nasty now and now. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need hope. And I've got to hold on to the hope that I profess. I have to cling to it. But the good news is that God is with us. Emmanuel is here. God is with us. I love Hebrews 13 and verse number 5. Because it says this. For he himself says. Amen. He himself said. Who was that? 
Jesus Christ himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Come on, I'm talking about God with us. Matthew 28, 20 says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Whenever we come to this season, I, I like to remind people that we do not worship a baby in a manger. Come on. El Niño Jesús, the baby Jesus, is not who we worship today. Was he a baby in a manger? Of course he was. Of course he was. But we celebrate this season because Jesus being born was a fulfillment of prophecy and a huge demonstration of the love of God for humanity. The scripture tells us this, that the word became flesh. Amen. John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The incarnation, my friend, is one of the greatest spiritual things that ever happened. God took on the form of humanity. He came to this earth with a mission, and that mission was to die on a cross to give his life as a ransom for many. But I want you to know we don't worship a baby in a manger. Nor do we worship a Jesus on a cross. Hello, somebody. You say, well, didn't Jesus die on the cross? Yes, he did. He was there for a few hours. But I'm going to tell you something. He's not there anymore. Nor do we go to a grave to worship him. Guess why? His grave is empty. He's not there. Come on. You say, well, who is it that we worship? We worship the resurrected Christ. We worship the ascended Christ. Come on. You say, well, I, I, I'd like to know where he is. I taught this to the kids in Sunday school today. Colossians 3, one. If you want to know where he is, it says, If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Christ is, at, has, is sitting at the right hand of God. Now I want you to understand this today. Jesus is God. He's part of the Trinity. Everything that the Father knows, Jesus knows. Everything that the Holy Spirit knows, Jesus knows. Come on. And he's not limited to being in one spot at a time because he's part of the Trinity. He can be everywhere all at once. Now, I know that's kind of hard for some of me, for me to get my head around. Amen. But I'm telling you, he's both sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's in every service where two or three are gathered in his name. Come on, somebody. I don't understand all of that. He said, well, what's he like, Pastor Bob? Is he gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Gentle Jesus. You've seen those pictures of Jesus looking like a little girl carrying a lamb on his shoulder. No, don't get me wrong. I, I know that's a beautiful picture of Jesus. He does go rescue the lost. But let me tell you something. It takes a lot of muscles to do that. You gotta climb down the crag from where he that lamb has fallen and go down there like a mountain climber and pick that little lamb up. And it might not be a little lamb, it might be a great big you that weighs two or three hundred pounds and heave him out. Let me tell you something, I get tired of people that make Jesus a sissy. Let me tell my Jesus is not a little tiny baby Jesus. Amen. He's a man's man. He's a conqueror. He is not a wimp because the Bible says that every single one of his enemies have been put underneath his feet. Amen. John had a vision of Jesus and he described him like this. Revelation 1 verse 13. Let me just read it to you. It says in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with the golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool. I get looking more like Jesus every day. Come on, somebody. <laughs> as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace and his voice sounded like the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in all of his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. 
but he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Come on, does that sound like a little whip to you? Uh-uh. That's the Jesus that you serve, my friend. That's the Jesus that is present in your life. That's the Jesus that the enemy sees when he comes up against against you. That's the Jesus that is fighting for you. Come on. And that's Jesus, the Christ that's in you. You know what Paul said? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You say, well, I need hope in the present. 2020 has been the kind of year that will just knock the hope right out of you. There's a lot of people say, man, I'm struggling in my life right now. Having a hard time making ends meet. I've been diagnosed with something and I'm struggling. I've been locked up in my house and and the stress is getting to me. The tension's driving me crazy. I've been so lonely with, you know, in my house. And there may be issues in your family. You may have addictions or hurts or habits or hang ups. (laughs) Let me tell you something. As long as God is with you, you have hope. Come on. And I've got news for you that the enemy of your soul will come to you and he will tell you it's no use. You might as well give up. You can't, God can't do anything. You are on your own. He's going to tell you it's going to get worse. He'll tell you you don't deserve God. You don't deserve his love. He'll tell you Jesus may do something for somebody else. But he's not going to do anything for you. He's not going to help you. Well, I've got news for the devil. He's a liar every single day of the week. Come on, somebody. He'll tell you that it's a time of trouble and it's going to go on forever. And his favorite thing is to point at your present current situation and say look at these circumstances they're here forever in this day and you want to know what we've got to do we've just got to back up the Psalms chapter 46 and verse number 1 and tell the devil this God is my refuge and strength and he's a very present help in time of trouble come on somebody give the Lord a hand of praise if God is with us if he's a present help in time of trouble we have hope when the enemy comes at you like that you need to tell him not who you are but whose you are do I have anybody that would say I belong to Jesus come on you have anybody say, I'm a part of the family. <laughs> Come on, I, I've been washed in the blood. I've been redeemed. <laughs> Amen. And you need to just look the devil in the eye and tell him, look, you start messing with me, you got to take on my whole family. And be, I'm going to tell you about my elder brother. His name is Jesus, and he already whoops you once. <laughs> Amen. He already crushed your head once, and the God of peace shall soon crush Satan underneath my feet shortly you start messing with me you take on the whole family because you want to know why I'm baptized I'm immersed I'm surrounded by the third person of the trinity the mighty holy spirit that flows in me and flows out of me and is upon me and all around me and standing behind me is God the father amen with all of his incredible grace and power Besides that, I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Amen. Besides that, I know some people that are my friends, and they know how to pray. And I have the authority in my heart that Jesus gave me. I know how to speak his words and give the, use the weapons he has given. I'm covered in the armory, armor of God. I have the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and on the left. Come on. I'm going to tell you something. It's high time that the church of Jesus Christ allow themselves to abound in hope. There's no reason why we ought to walk around with our head down and our chin dragging the ground. It's time if we look into the word we're going to get encouraged I love Romans 15 and verse 13 this was Paul's desire he said now may the God of hope (laughs) who do you serve I serve the God of hope well your situation sure does look dark it sure does look gray out there 
things don't look good, that's all right, because I serve the God of hope, and he will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Look at this last phrase, that you may abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. It's high time that we have a powerful move of the Holy Spirit in this congregation that allows us to be filled with joy and peace and allows us, my friend, to abound in hope in our life. Woo! He's hoping the past. He's hoping the present. But I want to tell you something. The greatest hope that we have is in the future. Ah, whenever I think of how Jesus came to earth the first time as a baby in a manger, I think that I can be assured that he's going to come as he said he would come the second time, riding on a white horse. Amen. Conqueror King. Amen. Come on. He's going to come again. I'm grateful for who Jesus was in the past. I'm grateful that he's with us in the present. But the great hope that we have, let me tell you something, it's not just for this life. It's not, let me say it again, I said the greatest hope that we have is not for this life. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you're going to get betrayed. In this life, you're going to get hurt. In this life, there's going to be difficulty. But my friends, sometimes we got to pick up our eyes and start thinking about the next life. Paul wanted us to understand about that. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19. He said this, and this is an amazing statement. He said, if... In this life only we have hope in Christ. Wait a minute. I'm so glad in this life I got hope in Christ. Hope in Christ allows me to believe God's going to bless me. God's going to heal me. God's going to help me. God's going to give me wisdom. There's a lot of things I can hope about in this life. But Paul said, hey, look. He said, if that's the only thing you got is hope in this life. What did he say? You're of all, of all men the most pitiable. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, the real hope doesn't come until out there. The real hope doesn't come until heaven. Amen. And I'll tell you about life. Sometimes life gets hard. We face tests and trials. We look at prophecy being fulfilled. We look at the problems in our culture, in our society. And sometimes what we got to do is wrap all that up in a nice little package and put it over here and then focus on the future. Come on. Take your eyes off of this present time and cling to the hope that's going to come. Paul said this in Romans 8, 18. He said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You say, well, Pastor Bob, is, is the economy going to pick up? I don't know. Will COVID get better or worse? I don't know. Will the vaccine help? I hope so, but I don't know. Will we ever get back to life as normal? I hope so, but I don't know. I don't have all the answers to those questions, but I do have hope in this world, and I do have hope in the future, because there's what the Bible calls the blessed hope. The blessed hope. You say, well, what's the blessed hope? The blessed hope is this, that, that the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and we who are alive and remain are going to get caught up together to meet him in the clouds. Come on. Amen. That's the blessed hope, the hope of the rapture. And I have the hope of the second coming of Christ. Amen. His glorious appearing. Amen. One day Christ will return all the way to planet earth. Amen. He'll be riding on a white horse with the armies of heaven following. Amen. He will set his foot down on the Mount of Olives and it will split in two. He will overthrow the crooked government of this world. He'll cast the Antichrist, the false prophet, and He'll into the lake of fire and he will bind Satan for a thousand years. Oh, who's ready to see that? Come on. Who's ready to watch that old dragon be bound for a thousand years? Has anybody ever had some difficulty with the enemy? I mean, in the future, we're going to see him bound. 
and we will reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that in that day, we're going to have a COVID-free body, a glorified body. Hello, somebody. A glorified body. Listen, Jesus' body walked right through walls. Just saying. There'll be no more sickness. No more pain. No more death. I like this one a lot. No more dentists. No more decayed teeth. No, but we're going to eat. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. And we're going to drink of the fruit of the vine when we stand with Jesus. So come on. I'm just telling you there's a lot to hope for. Y'all keep saying amen. I might preach all day. Y'all just add. Y'all just adding stuff to my notes. Let me bring it to a landing, as they used to say. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, and I like this part, listen to this. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God, will, God himself will be with them and be their God. Now hold on just a minute. The very promise that was given in the Old Testament that for 4,000 years they held on to, come on, that God would be with them. And we saw it fulfilled in Jesus, come on, the Emmanuel that came and was born. And the, and, and, and the, and the promise and the presence that we, we somehow kind of, we, you know, we, we enter into it not in its fullness and not in its completion. I'm not saying there's no such thing as the presence of God because I've been in the presence of God. But we just see through it that glass darkly. We just know it a little bit. But my friend, in that day, there's not going to be any doubt. He's going to be right there. Hello. God will dwell with His people. We're going to dwell with Him. That's the greatest hope in anybody could have that we're going to be the people of God and he goes on to say and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain because the former things have passed away and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street on, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever. Hope. Hope. Amen. Would you stand with me today all across this place? Amen. I'm so grateful for hope today. Amen. Amen. That sermon was fun to preach. Amen. 